George Strait, who known as the King of Country, has made fans admire the outstanding musical achievements despite deciding to give up his career three times. He once admitted that the tragic life sometimes pushed him into a corner, making his dream of becoming a country music superstar shaken. So what bad thing happened to George that forced him to give up his burning passion? It's all in this video, don't miss it. George Strait, the renowned country music artist, had earned a reputation as one of the most innovative and captivating live performers in the music industry. He was known for using groundbreaking techniques, such as 360-degree performances, to enthrall audiences worldwide. His longevity in the industry-playing arenas seemed like he could never quit. But the truth was more complex. George had actually quit music multiple times due to various tragedies that pushed him to the brink of giving up his passion. Even before George made a name for himself, he was a principled musician who believed in sticking to his country roots. He understood the importance of not compromising his art for commercial pop country. He didn't want to play with just any flashy session musicians. As a young and inexperienced musician at Southwest Texas State, he auditioned to sing in a band called Ace in the Hole, which consisted of ragtag kids who could perform country songs with authenticity. George served as their frontman, and together they started building a reputation by performing shows all over. However, George knew he needed to take a leap of faith to achieve his dreams. He moved to Nashville in pursuit of stardom, but the record executives were not interested in the Ralph and genuine country music he was macking. They were more inclined towards sanity Sid pop-friendly records to maximize sales. Face it with this rejection and disillusionment, George contemplated quitting music altogether and accepted a job designing cattle pins. It was at this critical juncture that George's wife, Norma, became his unwavering support system. She had stood by his side through years of pursuing his dreams, even during their financially challenging times. Norma knew that both of them had invested too much in George's career to give up now. She sat him down and convinced him to try for just one more year. She told him that if nothing happened in that time, he could resign himself to a life of designing cattle pins and she would be content with it. Norma wanted him to persevere for at least one more year, not just for himself, but for her as well. At Norma's insistence, George continued the grind and reunited with Ace in the hole, embarking on extensive tours. Their persistence and extra effort eventually paid off when George Strait landed a record deal in 1981. The commitment of his backing band, Ace in the Hole, remained steadfast, and they supported George through thick and thin over the next three decades. On September 26, 2012, George Strait made a significant announcement that sent shockwaves through the music industry he revealed that he was retiring from touring. The constant travel and rigorous performance schedule had taken a toll on him, and he longed to spend more quality time with his family. To bid farewell to his touring career in a grand fashion, he planned a massive tour called the Cowboy Rides Again Tour. This tour was an immense success, garnering rave reviews from critics and major publications while delighting his devoted fans. It achieved remarkable records, including the largest gross at a single show in the history of country concerts, an astonishing sum of over $18 million. Moreover, it boasted the distinction of being the largest indoor concert ever, with an impressive 104,000 people in attendance. George Strait's popularity was soaring, and his tour was breaking records in a way that seemed almost unparalleled, even compared to figures like the Pope. However, what truly made this tour special for George was not just the records it set or the accolades it received. It was the fact that he had his loyal and long-standing backing band, Ace in the Hole, with him. These honest, hard-working musicians had supported him for over three decades, and he had a deep and unwavering loyalty to them. 
George wouldn't have anyone else accompany him on this farewell tour. It was a heartfelt tribute to his enduring partnership with his bandmates. While the Cowboy Rides Again tour was a fitting farewell to George Strait's touring career, it raised the question of whether the King of Country was truly stepping down from his throne for good. The answer, as explained, is a bit complicated. George has indeed upheld his promise not to tour anymore, and he hasn't been very active in the studio either. It seems that his relationship with music has shifted from a passionate pursuit to more of a hobby. His most recent musical release was in 2018, when he put out a promotional song to endorse a brand of tequila he had invested in. This suggests that George may have more interest in his tequila business than in making music these days. However, the sentiment expressed by the narrator is that Georgia Strite has already provided the world with a treasure trove of timeless hits. He has earned the right to enjoy a slower pace, perhaps sipping a cocktail or two, and relishing the rewards of his legendary career. However, when George Strait was riding high on the crest of his success when tragedy struck. On June 25, 1986, his 13-year-old daughter, Jennifer, tragically lost her life in a car accident south of San Marcos. Jennifer had gone out for the evening with a group of friends, but George didn't inquire about her companions. Little did he know, Jennifer was in the company of a large group of young people, and their escapades were being led by a reckless older boy of 18. This older boy was driving his Ford Mustang and was determined to display his bravado by pushing the vehicle to dangerously high speeds, particularly on winding roads. As the Mustang careened down the road, the passengers found themselves caught in a harrowing experience. They were being whipped around by the car's reckless maneuvers, torn between the desire to speak up and say, slow down, and the fear of being labeled a killjoy. The older boy's audacity reached its limit when he took a corner at a perilou speed, causing the car to flip over. Tragically, Jennifer Strait was seated in the passenger seat without her seat belt fastened. The force of the accident caused her to be ejected from the vehicle, resulting in her almost instantaneous death. In contrast, the driver and the other passengers miraculously survived the crash. This heart-wrenching incident occurred at a time when George Strait's hard work was beginning to pay off, and his life was taking shape with a sense of fulfillment, especially with his beloved wife and daughter. However, the devastating tragedy that befell him and his family was so profound and catastrophic that it's challenging for most people to even comprehend the extent of their grief and loss. In the midst of dealing with the overwhelming grief of this tragedy, George found himself entangled in a complex legal battle regarding the punishment of the driver responsible for his daughter's death. Initially, the driver was indicted on charges of involuntary manslaughter, which seemed to be a significant step toward holding him accountable for his actions. However, as the legal proceedings unfolded, the charge against the driver was downgraded to a misdemeanor. Later, he faced a charge of criminally negligent homicide, adding another layer of complexity to the legal case. This situation became even more convoluted as three different juries were convened to assess the driver's culpability. Amidst this tumultuous legal battle, George Strait's experience must have been incredibly frustrating and emotionally taxing. It seemed that the person responsible for taking his daughter's life was constantly evading serious charges, making the pain of the loss even more difficult to bear. However, what makes George Strait stand out is his choice not to seek retribution or vengeance. Instead, he channeled his immense pain and sorrow into a noble cause, creating the Jennifer Lynn Strait Foundation. This foundation was established in honor of his late daughter and focused on charitable works. This action reveals George's character, demonstrating his commitment to making a positive impact on the world in the face of tragedy. Furthermore, George Strait found solace and strength in two things that have been constants in his life, good works and good music. Despite the devastating loss he experienced, he chose to cope by embracing these two pillars of his existence. 
In George's life, he decided to give up his career three times, and this was the most notable time. During his high school years at Pearsall High School, George had the opportunity to cross paths with a pretty girl named Norma Voss, who happened to be two years younger than him. Norma was the first girl I ever loved, George fondly remembers. Their roots ran deep, both growing up in the close-knit environment of a small town. George took the initiative to ask Norma out, but after just one date, they drifted apart. It wasn't long, however, before George realized he was missing out on something special. He reached out to Norma, rekindling their relationship, and the two began dating again. After graduating from high school in 1970, George Strait embarked on a new chapter in his life by enrolling at Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos, which was conveniently located near San Antonio. However, his college journey took an unexpected turn. After just one semester, George, driven by youthful idealism and the impulsive energy of young love, made a bold decision. He and his sweetheart, Norma, headed south of the border to Mexico and tied the knot in a spirited yet unofficial wedding ceremony. Subsequently, in December 1971, they held a more formal marriage ceremony to satisfy the expectations of their parents. Initially, George had every intention of following in his father's footsteps and becoming a rancher, eventually taking over the family ranch. However, before diving into ranch life, George felt a sense of duty to serve his country. He made the choice to join the army, and surprisingly, this decision would play a pivotal role in shaping his future as a country music superstar. When asked about his preferred assignment location, George humorously chose Hawaii, thinking, what the hell, try it. To his astonishment, his wish was granted, and he was stationed in the enchanting island paradise. Man, I got my orders to go to Hawaii, and I just could not believe it, he exclaimed. This twist of fate allowed newlyweds George and Norma to relish the serenity of the Hawaiian Islands during his military service. While stationed in Hawaii, George discovered another beautiful aspect of his life, and it came in the form of music. It was an album by the country music legend Merle Haggard, released in 1970, titled A Tribute to the Best Damn Fiddle Player in the World paying homage to Western swing legend Bob Wills. This musical tribute had a profound impact on George, igniting his passion for Bob Wills' music. That really turned me on to Bob Wills' music, George fondly recalls. By this time, George Strait was already contemplating whether he could follow in the footsteps of country music legends like Merle Haggard and Bob Wills. He had always possessed a love for singing, and his desire to pursue a career in music began to take shape. To kickstart this journey, he made a pivotal decision. He acquired a cheap guitar and a songbook featuring the works of the iconic Hank Williams. With these tools in hand, he embarked on his musical odyssey. A stroke of good fortune awaited George during his time in the Army. The base commander made a decision that would significantly impact his life. A decision was made to form a band to entertain the troops and George saw this as a golden opportunity to showcase his singing talent. After trying out for the lead singer position, he clinched the role. Singing for fellow soldiers not only provided an excellent form of entertainment, but also invaluable practice for the future stage performances that he had yet to realize were in store for him. George reflects on this period saying, it gave me the time I needed to learn all about playing dates. In addition to his burgeoning music career, one more beautiful chapter unfolded in George's life during his stay in Hawaii. In 1972, he and Norma welcomed their first child, a daughter named Jennifer. The new family initially attempted to make Hawaii their permanent home following George's military service, but financial constraints led them to return to Texas after six months. They established their household in San Marcos, and George made the decision to re-enroll in college, pursuing an agriculture degree with the support of the GI Bill. At this point, he was still leaning towards a future in ranching or rodeo, but his growing passion for music was impossible to ignore. In pursuit of his musical aspirations, George took a significant step 
by posting an advertisement on a bulletin board seeking to join a new band. It didn't take long for a local group comprised of his fellow college students to recognize the exceptional country voice he possessed, and they eagerly welcomed him into their musical fold. At the age of 23, George Strait found himself as the oldest member of the newly formed Ace in the Hole Band, which made its debut in October 1975 at the Cheatham Street Warehouse in San Marcos, Texas. They quickly became a regular fixture at local clubs, performing their brand of traditional country and western swing. George, in his matter-of-fact style, reminisced about those early days, saying, There were a lot of places we could play and we played most of them. For George, this period was characterized by the joys of the honky-tonk circuit, where he and his bandmates played authentic country music every night, even if the financial rewards were not substantial. In 1976, the Ace in the Hole band caught a significant break when they had the opportunity to record several songs for the small independent D records, including some of George's own compositions. Reflecting on his songwriting efforts, George noted, I tried to write them like what I thought was a good country song, though he never actively pursued songwriting as a significant part of his career. Yet another break came George's way when he was invited to Nashville to participate in recording demo tracks. This would not be the last time he faced resistance from industry gatekeepers who believed that his voice was too country for the mainstream in Music City. George returned to Texas, where he completed his agriculture degree in 1979. He took a job as the ranch manager at the Hart Ranch in Martindale, Texas. I was doing the ranching to supplement my income, he explained, adding, I really liked it, but it sure was hard. In 1981, George Strait, at the age of 27, was married to Norma, and they were eagerly anticipating the arrival of their second child, George Jr., who was affectionately known as Bubba. However, despite the excitement of impending fatherhood, George was grappling with mounting domestic responsibilities that seemed to be pulling him away from his musical aspirations. He felt a growing sense of frustration and pressure in his life. As George's responsibilities at home increased, he began to doubt whether his dream of a successful music career was feasible. He confessed, I felt like I was spinning my wheels and he feared the possibility of still playing in bars and honky-tonks at the age of 42. These doubts led him to question his own abilities, wondering if he was good enough to make it in the highly competitive world of country music. In a moment of despair, George Strait made the difficult decision to give up on his dream of becoming a country music star. He shared this decision with his bandmates from Ace in the Hole and made plans to pursue a full-time job in Uvalde, Texas, with a company that specialized in designing cattle pens. It seemed like his music career was coming to an end, and he was ready to embrace a more stable and conventional life. However, George's wife, Norma, noticed a profound change in her husband almost immediately after he made this decision. George became increasingly difficult to be around, and he seemed to be consumed by a sense of defeat. He moped around their San Marcos home, and his dreams appeared to be slipping away. Fearing that she didn't want to live with George in this state of despondency, Norma recognized the depth of her husband's passion for music. She decided to encourage him to give his dream one more chance— offering a glimmer of hope that would ultimately alter the course of George Strait's life and set him on the path to becoming one of the most iconic country music stars in history. Norma's unwavering support played a pivotal role in George Strait's journey to country music stardom. After George had decided to abandon his musical aspirations and was on the verge of starting a new job in Uvalde, Texas, Norma managed to convince him to give his dream one more shot. She convinced him to commit to music for another year, deferring his career transition for the time being. A week before he was scheduled to start his new job, George took a decisive step. He contacted the prospective employer and informed them that he wouldn't be taking the job. Norma's encouragement and belief in his talent had convinced him to follow his passion and take one more shot at making it in the music industry. Norma's support was a driving force in George's life, 
He acknowledged her unwavering belief in his potential, saying, Norma has always been very supportive. Success is something she always wanted for me, because she knew how bad I wanted it. With a renewed sense of determination, George made a pivotal phone call to Irv Woolsey, a former nightclub manager and friend who was now an executive at the MCA Nashville record label. George remembered Woolsey's connection to the music industry and asked if there was a producer in Nashville who could help him. This phone call would change the trajectory of George's career. Irv Woolsey, recognizing George's talent and potential, connected him with producer Blake Mevis. George returned to Nashville and started recording with Mevis. Several songs were recorded during this session. However, the response from the Music City music executives was all too familiar. They deemed his music too country, a sentiment he had encountered before. After facing rejection and resistance from the Nashville music scene due to his two country style, George Strait refused to be discouraged. He picked himself up, dusted off his aspirations, and decided to give his dream another shot. George, along with Erv Woolsey, managed to convince another MCA executive to visit San Marcos and experience the ace in the whole band in their natural element, a honky-tonk nightclub. This approach worked, and it finally led to a breakthrough for George. Following this performance, George was offered a chance to record a single for MCA. The prospect of success hung in the balance, and George held on to hope as he approached this new opportunity. I had my fingers crossed, he admitted, aware of the significance of this moment. Upon arriving in Nashville, George encountered the pressures of conformity to the industry standards. His iconic cowboy hat, which had become synonymous with his image, was a point of contention. The city's influence tried to change him, but George remained resolute, refusing to shed his distinctive identity. He was unyielding in his commitment to stay true to himself and his roots. George and Irv Woolsey found a promising song titled Unwound, a heartbroken drinking balag that resonated with their vision. They were determined to make this their breakthrough track. Unwound was released and began receiving radio play. To George's amazement, it entered the charts on May 16, 1981, just two days before his 29th birthday. At the time, he was still working his day job as a ranch foreman in San Marcos. He recounted the surreal experience of hearing his song on the radio as it climbed the charts while he was out working on the ranch. I was shocked, he exclaimed. Unwound went on to reach the impressive position of number six on the charts, and George was granted the opportunity to record a full-fledged album. This taste of success only intensified his hunger for more. One day, as he gazed at the gold albums hanging on the walls of the MCA offices, he asked Irv a poignant question. You think I'll ever get one of those? The reply he received from Irv was cautiously optimistic. I don't know. We'll have to see. As an unproven newcomer to the music scene, George Strait found himself with limited control over his debut album, Strait Country. He was hesitant to embrace some of the pop-oriented elements that producer Blake Mevis wanted to incorporate, but his resistance proved unsuccessful. George recalled, The songs that we chose for that first album, I didn't have just a hell of a lot to say about. I did think that the majority of the songs we cut on there were good songs, but there are some songs that, if I were to go back right now, I'd try to say, no, we're not going to do that. Despite his reservations, the album achieved success, helping George establish a foothold on the charts. Songs like If You're Thinking You Want a Stranger, There's One Coming Home, reached number three, and Fool Hearted Memory finally brought him to the top of the charts. However, as George's career continued to ascend, he found himself at odds with certain aspects of the music industry, including music videos, which were becoming an increasingly important promotional tool. George's reluctance to embrace this new medium was evident in his first video for You Look So Good in Love, a song that soon became his third number one hit. He described the video as embarrassing, corny, syrupy, gag me, reflecting his discomfort with the format. 
George's aversion to music videos set the tone for his career, leading him to produce only a limited number of videos over the course of two decades. He admitted, I've never cut one that I really liked, and he often approached video production with a degree of reluctance. His lack of enthusiasm for this promotional tool was reflected in the final product, as he believed that the quality of the videos mirrored the effort he put into them. George Strait's dissatisfaction with the direction of his career didn't end with music videos. He grew increasingly impatient with the pop influences that were being added to his records, despite his strong affinity for hardcore country and western swing. He remained true to the style he and the ace in the whole band had honed during their countless performances on the road. Tensions came to a head when George was almost finished with his planned fourth album. Frustrated with the direction his music was taking, he made a bold declaration to the new head of MCA, Jimmy Bowen, stating, I've got ten tracks, and I'm never going to put my voice on them. This marked a turning point in George's career. Up until that point, he had been too intimidated to assert himself in the studio. However, with several number one hits and an ACM Male Vocalist of the Year award to his name, the balance of power had shifted. George Strait, after asserting his artistic control and ensuring that his albums met his standards, continued to dominate the country music scene with a more traditional country sound. The transition to a purer country style didn't impede his chart success. In fact, he started producing hit after hit. Now George Strait has a deep appreciation for a few specific sounds that bring him immense joy and tranquility. These sounds represent a retreat from the demands of fame and a connection to the simplicity of life in Texas. One of his cherished sounds is the serenity of a still Texas lake where the only disruptions are the soothing chirping of crickets or the satisfying plop when his fishing line sinker touches the waiter. It's a moment of solitude and reflection, a sanctuary in nature. Another source of joy for George is the distinct swoosh of his golf club, swiftly followed by the satisfying pop when it strikes the golf ball. This experience offers him an escape from the spotlight, a moment where he can be himself and find solace in the game. The rhythmic, reassuring sound of his horse's hooves hitting solid ground is another treasured sound for George. It symbolizes a connection to the land and a timeless escape from the demands of his public life. Despite these peaceful sounds that provide George with solitude and tranquility, there's another sound that he can't resist, the roar of a crowd. Whether it's at one of his concerts or a thrilling rodeo, the electrifying screams of his fans continuously draw him in, captivating his heart and spirit. The dynamic between his desire for privacy and his love for performing music and pleasing his fans has been a defining factor in George Strait's life and career. This delicate balance has been the key to his remarkable success in the world of country music. For more than two decades, he has set the industry standard. While other artists may have had albums that sold more copies, none have consistently connected with both fans and critics as George Strait has. Some artists have been media favorites, but none have matched his enigmatic and reserved persona. Others may have had bigger chart-topping hits, but none have discovered and interpreted as many exceptional songs as he has, doing so with a smooth, flawless, and perfect voice that sets him apart from his peers. What do you think about George Strait's life and times when he wanted to give up his music career? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.